Thank you very much. Uh, this is a pleasure and I'm very happy to be able to, to be here and to share my ideas with you. I really hope that you will find this interesting and thought provoking. And without further ado, uh, I will go ahead. Uh, well, you already know the title of my presentation, Crop Evolution Under Domestication Policy Implications for Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems. And I will start by, by um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I will start by talking about crop, crop domestication. You know, crop domestication, I think, is a, it's a fascinating example of evolution, but a process that has changed humanity or influenced humanity in, uh, in the course of human history and continues to influence the destiny of mankind, mankind today. You know, domestication is a distinctive coevolutionary, mutualistic relationship between the domesticate, the domesticant, and the domesticate. In this case, we are talking about uh, 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 humans and in and, and, and plants. Uh, I mean, obviously, there is domestication of animals, but here we I will be focusing more on plants. And see, this diversity of domesticate, domesticated plant species has been and continues to be the basis of, for food supply and good nutrition. And this is a particularly important, and I hope you keep this in mind, is that a diversity of plant-based foods is a, comp a key component of a healthy diet. And also diets are a key link between human health and environmental sustainability. This is coming from a very recent uh, study that, that just came out uh, a few years ago. So bearing, in this, bearing this in mind, I will go to talk about that, you know, crop evolution is, is uh, and, and domestication, under domestication. It's not a process that happened 10,000 years ago when human domesticated, let's say in, in the case of Mexico, humans of, uh, domesticated maize from Teocintle, the wild relative, but it's a process that we argue continues today, you know, and in many parts of the world and for numerous crops. So it's not something, it's not a relic of the past, but it's a continuous process that today is, is happening. This is particularly happening in centers of diversity uh, and that all that uh, tend to coincide with the centers of domestication, the places where domestication took place historically, but it, they continue to have, and they continue to, the original domestication, but it continues to, to be a process, an ongoing process. And this is particular, you know, smallholder farmers growing native varieties tend to drive this process. And this is an important message that I hope you, you keep in mind as you listen to my presentation. And that is because by saving seed and their seed for replanting and sharing with other farmers, you know, from one, from one, gen, from one season, planting season to the next, they plant, they harvest, part of the harvest they use for our, our own consumption, then they sell it or sell it or share it. But part of it is kept if, to replanting. And this, this contrasts very much for many of you who are from the US. This, this obviously is a process that used to be in the past, but now it has stopped. And, and this is part of what we will discuss today. But in, in any case, the, the point is that this practice of saving seed, replanting, and sharing seed with others is a process that, that still is common in many parts of the world for many crops. And what is key is that this, uh, this process allows evolutionary processes to continue for many crops in numerous environments and circumstances across the world. And here I'm going to show you, sorry, I, I'm going to show you where are these centers. There are global hotspots of diversity because it's true. This process of diversity, of crop domestication and diversity is not just everywhere in the world, but there are certain areas where it has been concentrated. And you can see this, this is data from, uh, you know, from, uh, from gene banks. Gene banks are, you know, in the past people have been going and collecting the samples of, of many different crops and putting them into, uh, into, in many cases are sort of like humongous refrigerators where they keep these samples with the idea that they, they document what it is and maybe they can be used. And so that and based on this data, you can really see that there are areas of, for example, Mexico and, and South America, parts of Africa, India, <clears throat> parts of the Middle East that are, are where you have a high concentration of diversity. So these are the areas where I'm talking about. I'm not talking about everywhere in the world, but I'm talking about these areas. These areas are, and in these areas, you know, there's still agriculture plays a key role. So 
you know, why, so these farmers, the farmers are maintaining this diversity, they're saving seed in these areas where I just illustrated in, in my map, uh, you know, why, why is it, they are providing a service to society because the crop's capacity to adapt to diverse new and unforeseen circumstances is key to, is key to, 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 to achieve sustainable agricultural food systems. By sustaining crop evolution, these farmers tend to generate the broad and novel uh, uh, genetic variation necessary for crops to adapt to change. And I think this is very important. It's a dynamic process. It's not something about the past. It's something about the present and the future. And we can conceptualize this process that is happening uh, as something that you probably never heard of before, but it's, I think it's a, another very important uh, uh, concept that you should bear in mind because this, this constitutes an evolutionary service that is of global relevance. And uh, we define an evolutionary service as the uses uh, or services that humans they are pro produce, that are produced for, from the evolution uh, sorry, the uses or services that humans uh, uh, derive uh, uh, that are produced from the evolutionary service, as according to Faith, who, who coined the term, or evo service. That's the other way they refer it. So these farmers, these small scale farmers, by maintaining these practices, are, are contributing an important service, has generated a, a historically, but it continues to be important. And it's also a very important part to recognize that there's currently there's a whole revaluation of the role that small help, smallholder farmers plays in the food and agricultural food systems of the world. And this is illustrated by uh, very recent studies that show how they not only are maintaining these evolutionary services, which this is key part of my, my talk today, but also are contributing quite a bit, substantial amount of foods. Here I show the results, a uh, summary of the results of three three very important studies that have the very recent, who showed that in fact, these very small farmers at scale far, whole herd their farmers that usually tend to be perceived as unproductive or as or basically subsistence, in fact, can co contribute a lot to the food supply of the world. Uh, and here you see it, it can be between, you know, up to almost 50%, you know, farmers uh, in, in farms of less than five hectares, or let's say, uh, it's about 10 acres using the, 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 the acre system, you know, can be 50%, 70%, more than 70%, and also for many different crops and, um, and in many different countries. So this is telling us how these small scale farmers are really contributing to the world. But see this, also these small scale farmers are maintaining quite a bit of diversity. And here in the in the left, there is a, a graph that comes from one of the papers at uh, Ricciardi uh, that looked at the percentage of richness. It's a measure of richness according to farm size. And you can see that when very small uh, farm sites have a lot of diversity, goes, which goes down as you go into a, a larger farmers. And, and the graph on the, on the right is a little bit more difficult to understand, but basically what it means is, again, it, it just says that a lot of the diversity is concentrated. The diversity of crops, here we are talking about diversity of crops, not, of, not the diversity of varieties within one crop, but diversity of crops is also concentrated in the, in the, in the, in the, by, in the areas farmed by very small farms. So again, this is telling us the important role that uh, smallholder farmers are, are contributing to the world by maintaining the evolutionary process, therefore these evolved services that I talked about, but also contributing quite a lot of food in this. And I, I should add that these studies are very interesting because it's, it's bringing uh, big data to, to bear into the issues of this contribution of these smallholder farmers. So I want to talk about uh, uh, a case study that we have done uh, a lot of work, working in Conavio, which is the Mexican campesinos and their contribution to the maize evolution of domestication. We have shown that camp campesinos is the way we are referring to smallholder farmers in Mexico. They're still, uh, you know, about uh, their plant maize, native native maize, and they use both uh, planted for self-consumption, but also for uh, for sale and for exchange. And so these campesinos, these smallholder farmers, plant like 4 million hectares a year uh, with more than 50 native races or native broad groups of, of, of maize, maize or corn, because also it's, it's referred as corn in the US, it races in multiple environments. And what are the implications of this? This large maize population that they maintain preserves genetic diversity 
particularly re rare alleles, and provides multiple opportunities for the appearance of potentially beneficial mutations. Also, why is this important? Because since the future is unpredictable, the large scale and, and, and the more diverse the scope of this process, the more genetic diversity available, the higher the probability that some alleles, current or rare or, or known, might be become adaptive under new conditions. So it, therefore, this creates an option value of the genetic diversity under evolution. Option value is this idea that maybe right now things might not seem valuable, but in the future they might become very valuable. So the current, but what are the issues that are associated? Unfortunately, the current agricultural development strategies and policies in the very, in developing world promote crop productivity but ignore crop evolution. And why is this important? But again, in the developing world is where this process of crop evolution under domestication this, this continues. So therefore, they are, they are um, the conditions. Uh, so uh, this happens because the, you know, many crops and varieties are, are grown on their uh, homogeneous conditions to accomplish economies of scale and in order to reduce financial costs and simplify management in intensive agricultural systems. But in doing so, they implicitly discourage crop evolution in farmers field by promoting the replacement of native varieties by improved varieties fostering an increased reliance on purchasing commercial seeds from the formal seed system. Formal seed system in this case means like commercial companies uh, that, in, that come from what we call the formal breeding sector, where it's scientific improvement in this, um, for, for these crops. And discontinuing, fostering the discontinuation of farmer management that I just, is of savings and sharing seed. As a consequence, the evolutionary service farmers can provide can be diminished or eliminated. But even if this happens, the evolution of pests and disease and weeds continue. And there is increased selective pressures on, on, on them, on the crops associated with uh, the circumstances. It, it is, as I told before, there is uh, um, evolutionary services, but there's also evolutionary services. So, so you can see that even though we might constrain the, the process of crop evolution at, from the crops, that doesn't, that, that doesn't decrease the evolution of other components, which sometimes can be deleterious to the well-being of humans. So that means that the implications of uh, the, this current uh, uh, development strategies and policies uh, for centers of pro-diversity, as I said, many of these policies are being are implemented in the areas where small-scale farmers exist and they maintain this diversity and they maintain this process of crop evolution. And these strategies and, and, and policies are encouraged by governments, international and national development organizations, international and national uh, research organizations and private companies. However, you know, if we start thinking in terms of evolutionary services, their adoption by and su success among smallholder implies, holders implies that less novel, broad and novel genetic variation will be available to adapt crops to changing circumstances and agriculture and food systems might, might be less likely to face change successfully particularly it, because of climate change that create unexpected uh, situations. So now I'm gonna give you, now to illustrate, this sound might seem very abstract. So to, in order to illustrate what I was just saying, I'm gonna, and they are, I'm gonna give you an example of a very important development process that is happening in Africa, which is the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. This is, uh, this big program is, uh, it's, uh, the, general uh, objective is to develop practical ways to improve production and income for millions of smallholder African farmers. And who could be against that? I mean, obviously this is a, it's a worthwhile objective, but we need to think about beyond that. And even though the objective might be very good, we have to think about what are the implications. This project has been, uh, has been a, a very important, uh, received very important investment, particularly from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation which has been documented that they received $625 million over a period from 2006 and 2018. So this has been a major uh, investment. And a key priority of this uh, big uh, program is the, is the program is to upgrade, 
to upgrade African seed systems. And by meaning upgrading African seed systems, we are talking about you know, introducing, introducing more scientific breeding and using private companies and develop more of a private sector um, uh, seed systems, which we will call formal seed systems. And that's it's, it's part, and this has been embodied in what we call the program for African seed system or PASS. And this program promotes private sector seed production. And they have been uh, then in this year, they have produced 464 varieties of 15 crops, mainly maize or corn, 118, cassava, 67, beans, 67, rice, 59. You should notice, and here on the left, you can, in the right, you can see the map with uh, all the quantities I took from the from the report of PAS. You can see the number, the amount of seeds that they have been producing. This is improved seeds that then will be commercialized through private companies. A very interesting part is that of these 15 crops, the most important crops in terms have, are actually crops that have been introduced from the Americas. Clearly, they are mostly in the Americas, the maize, cassava, and beans. But, um, and, and they are indeed very important in Africa. It's not to say that because they are introduced, they are not important. They are very important. And actually, they have been introduced a long time ago. So in fact, even they have been subject to evolution under domestication, particularly when many of these crops have been 500 years already evolving under African conditions. However, also I want to point out another very interesting point is that the, the really the investment in terms of uh, native African crops such as sorghum, cowpeas, and millets is much, much lower than the investment that have been going into these American, American crops in, in the sense of the Americas. Um, so this is, this is important to, to bear in mind. And you know, one of the interesting questions is why PASS promotes fiber, uh, private seed sector production. And again, I remind you, this is a very important investment and policy, uh, you know, objective. And, and not only are they investing, but they are changing policies and laws across Africa to, to make this happen. So it's not just a technical issue, it's also a policy, political broad issue. And here I'm quoting, um, crop varieties uh, are in need of regular renewal to help farmers overcome constantly evolving threats from pests and disease adapt to new growing conditions caused by climate change and take advantage of new agricultural innovations. Okay, that might sound very uh, similar to what I just mentioned earlier, but obviously I, I, what I mentioned earlier, I, I, it was independent of this, but bear this in mind. And quote again, PAS believes that locally owned private sector enterprises that lie, live or die based on their ability to provide smallholder farmers with high quality seeds when and where they need them, offer an opportunity to build a sustainable seed supply infrastructure in Africa. So basically what we are seeing is that PAS, this program believe that the private seed enterprise, seed sector enterprise can actually replace crop evolution or domestication. Listen how the first quote, it's really similar to what I said of the why crop evolution was an important play because it allows us to, to, to adapt to change and generate the, the variation needed today. And so basically what PASS, this PASS is, is arguing is that somehow the seed sector that includes the breeding, the distribution, the commercialization, and a market-based process can contribute, can replace crop evolution or domestication. And one might uh, question this in the sense here, that what I'm showing you, this is Africa and part of Asia, and all those dot, red dots that you see are, are examples of sorghum. Sorghum, as I said, was as a, as a important crop in Africa uh, with great, and you can see the great diversity. Each of those dots implies a solution, a solution for specific environment and cultural and economic conditions. Many of these are historical, doesn't mean necessarily that these, uh, these uh, uh, varieties currently exist there, but it gives you an idea of the importance of the widespread use of this crop in the different situations in which uh, they are growing. So one question, one of my questions, to what extent, you know, this private sector, which only produce maybe 20 uh, varieties of sorghum really would be able to address the issues of the diversity of environments, both uh, so uh, you know agroecological as well as social. That is that happens across Africa. So bear that in mind. 
And, and instead of, you know, also to what extent you're using all the diversity of, 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 uh, of, of uh, genetic diversity that's present. So this tells, takes us to, to think about the seed system, the, the system by which people get seeds. And, 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 there are, and this is the, one of the clear policies that pass, for example, but that is, pass is just an example. There are many other issues and it's a, this is more of a global policy and historical policy. Seed systems transformation really is a challenge for crop evolution of domestication. Why? Because on the one hand, and here I'm gonna contrast the farmer seed systems versus the modern seed systems, or mean the ones that are promoted by past. The farmer seed systems are open. Many farmers incorporate, keep and discard seed, share seed as I pointed. But in the modern seed system by design is limited and the entrance and discarding of seed is, is, is very constrained and controlled. And this is central to generate profits because if you are saving seed, you don't buy seed and that's not good for business. Uh, the farmer seed system is decentralized. Farmers and communities make different independence decisions in multiple locations, whereas the modern seed systems is centralized. Few seed enterprise make decisions about which trades and conditions in selected locations. Still might be around the world, but still there are selected locations. The farmer seed system is local with the, the spatial scope of the system is local, but also there might be seed flows, long seed flows, whereas the global, the modern seed system is global with a spatial reach of a few companies and global enterprises that is, is global. And whereas the farmer seed system is governed by, governed by cultural norms, such as reciprocity and fairness, and I did get into all the details, but that has been well, uh, that has been well documented in the literature. The, the modern seed systems is only governed by profitability. And again, this is my point is not to demonize one or the other. It's just to say, to show to you the contrast and, why, and to then imply, look at the implications of this contrast. However, I have to say that while I don't want to demonize modern seed systems, farmer seed systems tend to be demonized or tend to be seen as inferior within the development paradigm that uh, the agriculture paradigm that that, uh, that is currently dominant. So the pharmacy systems, uh, the, you know, what I want to make the point is the pharmacy systems that underpin, underpin crop evolution go against the business model of pharmacy systems. And, and this is a fact, this is not, uh, as I tried to explain in my presentation, and why? Because sharing, because we have, as we see, sharing versus excludability, moral rules versus profitability, shared versus shared versus private ownership, heterogeneous versus homogeneous conditions, local adaptations versus broad adaptations and economies of scale. So having said all this, I have to say and to recognize that higher agricultural productivity is needed to feed nine billion people by mid, mid uh, of the mid century. So clearly there, this is not, I don't want to, try to present like I'm a, a naive or romantic uh, thing that the small scale farmers are there. I mean, they are poor in many cases, they have many challenges. So, and, and we need to produce a lot of food. But at the same time, we also need to have the options that continued evolutionary process provide for agricultural, sustainable agriculture and food systems. You know, and as, as I point out, particularly on the increasing unpredictable changes that climate change is bringing about. And again, I ask you, you think that a private sector creating just a few varieties that try to address multiple environments, as I show with sorghum, would be an, a, enough to, to, to accomplish this. The challenge is to find the right balance uh, between high productivity and the evolutionary service to agriculture and food systems. So the key institutional ch challenges to do for the future is that uh, uh, the formal seed systems are heavily prioritized by policies and, and the, uh, development policies and interventions. Clearly, the business model uh, increasingly uh, the business model increasingly becomes a dominant narrative in agricultural development. And then the crucial question is how to create national and global uh, policies and environments that fosters the, co the coexistence of farmers and formal seed systems of crop diversity, recognizing the contribution that both systems make to this food, the, the, the food systems uh, and, and the future of our food supply. 
So this takes me to the last, uh, the, the last slide and to, and to ask you, to, we, that we need to rethink agricultural development strategies and policies for smallholder farmers in, high crop, uh, in areas of high crop diversity. And that means by recognizing and reward, reward smallholders farmers for maintaining crop evolution on their domestication. And this should be based on very simple principles. Uh, the continued and widespread use of native varieties, the practice of saving and sharing seeds and farming in a diversity of environments. And so therefore it's, it's really thinking how can, the idea is not to maintain the status quo, it's really to help, these systems are not stat static, they are changing. But the question is how can we uh, you know, foster a change that, that based on these principles that generate additional benefits to all these small other farmers and additional supply of food for, for, for the world. And that means also that we need to go beyond just increasing the, the, the obsession with increasing yields, but also to about improving post-harvest management, access to markets and offer income opportunities. This strategy should be, and I think it's very important and that this strategy should be implemented at scale and with a scope needed to maintain crop evolution or domestication as a significant process. And with that, I finish my presentation. Thank you very much, and I hope uh, and I hope you you find this interesting, and we have some interesting discussion now. Thank you, Mauricio. That was a really wonderful talk. Um, so oh, I just want yeah. I just want to remind everyone that if you have questions, please put them in the Q and A, and we'll try to address them. Um, so I'm going to start. I have some questions that I want to ask. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess one of the questions that I have is mostly about what this looks like in terms of policy. How do we provide support to these farmers that are traditionally undervalued um, without, you know, like completely co-opting their systems? You know, what's that actually look like in terms of policy? Well, that is a very important issue. And I, I think that that's the, I think that's the, the future. That's what we have to think. And that's what I want you so. To, to rethink about, uh, you know, what do we do? Um, you know, the first step, I think, is recognizing the value. It's recognizing that the importance of what they're doing, because this has been invisible. And yes, there is more and more recognition of the importance of, um, of the, supply, the, 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 the supply of food, and as I, because the data I show, but also what has still been, been missed, I think, is this contribution of the crop evolution that's happening of the evolutionary services. And also recognizing that this, this is, this is a, evolution is a numbers game. Therefore, it's important to have scale. So it's not, the issue is not to have policies that support three communities to maintain 10 land races in, in two countries. I mean, that may be good, it's good, it's, it might be interesting for learning, for other things, but that's not gonna make it. So one of the most important things also is start promoting and subsidizing, you know, uh, all these uh, change, uh, the, the, ch the change in, in the seed systems that sometimes it's not based, it's based more on ideology on this uh, perceived belief that, for example, hy hybrids by definition are superior. Well, they are superior under certain circumstances, not everywhere. And, and really try to be more critical about the evidence and, and not just because I think a lot of the development, agricultural development narrative is based on, on an idealized idea of trying to, for example, export the model of the US agriculture that has been so successful and the idea that it can be simply exported to Mexico or Africa. And, and, and there might be niches with this, this agriculture model works very well, but there might be many other niches where it doesn't. So I think Parties, and, 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 I, and as I said, I, I think we are just starting to, to rethink, uh, we should start rethinking this. And that, that's an important message of my presentation. Thank you. Uh, so now I'll ask this question from Taylor Ricketts. Uh, he asks, have any private companies tried to build a business model around maintaining crop diversity and in-situ evolution? So are there actual business opportunities that involve on-farm evolution and seed sharing, et cetera? facilitating that exchange or securing the diversity itself. That I know, no, I mean, if you really do, as I try to illustrate the business model of, of uh, seed enterprises, it's about selling seed, you know, and selling seed implies that there, there should be property rights and selling seed means 
that you cannot share C and that you cannot, and, and there is a whole host of ways in which your legal ways in which people, in which companies constrain that. And in the developing, it, it varies very much by, by countries, but you know, the, the, in many countries, uh, you know, if, if, if the certain variety or certain is not in a list, like for example, in France, it's illegal to sell that seed. So, the, so in, and I think we need to understand that there is a, an important uh, contradiction between the business model the, the traditional system business model of seed enterprises and, and the other one. However, seed enterprises benefited, have benefited historically from all this evolution because all of this uh, is, is, is like a, a, that, that an asset of wealth that has been stored and that has been used. And, and this all also goes into other, the whole discussion of farmers' rights versus breeders' rights and and what is the, the distribution of the benefits and costs? I mean, clearly this is a much broader uh, set of issues, but as far as I can know, there's no, I don't understand. I don't know any traditional business, uh, seed business model that would be compatible with this. And this is one of the great challenges. Thank you. Um, okay, so now this question from Andrew that says, who gets to decide what counts as a land race or variety? and which ones are selected for conservation? Is it mostly professionals who make this decision? Well, you know, as I said, right now, a lot of what is happening, uh, first of all, is, is a lot of what is happening is fact, it's happening de facto. I mean, farmers continue to maintain this diversity, sometimes in spite of policies, in spite of policies that want them to abandon this. I mean, they continue, they have continued to be, I mean, there was the prediction that uh, you know everybody would change and, and use commercial seeds, and this hasn't happened in many parts of the world. In some parts it has, but in many parts it hasn't happened. Clearly, this has happened in, in very commercialized system, but usually these very commercialized systems are in the best environments, the most homogeneous, where you can control the water, etc., the soils, etc. So, but you know who decides what is maintained is in the fact is the farmers. And in fact, that's what's so incredible about the system. By having decentralized decision-making is what is creating the variation that you cannot, that you cannot um, comprehend by just a centralized system in which you only favor certain things. It's, it's really, it's, it's, it's like having a humongous lottery system in which you know, some things are successful, some things are not. But you cannot predict, and that's that's the beauty of having decentralized decision making, and at an incredible scale. And that's the type of things that I I have been advocating, or I'm advocating in a way uh, that what we need to rethink about. And I think that there's good scientific evidence to to suggest that, to to support this this uh, this perspective. Thank you. That's yeah. That's a really great answer. Um, okay, so this question from Yolanda Chen that says, hi Mauricio, thanks for the nice talk. Have you heard of successful models for payments for ecosystem services? There doesn't seem to be a link between the formal seed system and the informal seed system. Well, it, it depends. On, well, yes, I have heard of uh, obviously uh, payments uh, for environmental services. There has been some efforts to try to do sort of environmental payment for services to maintain land races, for example. And I am a bit critical of this in the sense, well, they first, it's not very conceptually, this is not necessarily they're recognizing this evolution, crop evolutionary potential under domestication. It's implicit, but it's not there. And it has been done at a very small scale. So the idea is that you find, you know, that you identify certain types of potatoes or, or quinoa and that is planted by very few people. And you say, okay, we are gonna, you know, if you if you give you uh, so much extra money or or these benefits, would you continue to plant them? The problem I, I see is that this again, this is uh, this is done in a very very small scale. That from an evolutionary perspective, probably is irrelevant. And so then, so clearly there there is a challenge there. And the second part of the question was uh, so 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 I'm not aware of, of successful process of, of, of payment for ecosystem service in the context of evolution yet. Right. Um, yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, let's ask this question from Alyssa Frame. What is your take on GMOs? 
Do you think that we can produce enough food for the growing population with mostly smallholder farms using traditional practices, crop domestication and seed saving instead of GMOs? Well, first of all, the GMOs is just one technology and many other technologies. And I have to say that, for example, hybrids don't necessarily have to be GMO. I also think that sometimes the GMO, the, the GMO lobby, let's put it that way, makes an argument that without GMs, we are not going to produce them up food. I think that I, I, and I'm not necessarily against GMOs. I mean, they have a role. And, and I, again, I want to make sure that you see that I'm not advocating that everybody should be small scale farmers planting, saving seed. I'm saying that there are certain parts of the world where it is worth for humanity to maintain this process and to find ways of rewarding farmers that keep this. I'm not saying that this is the solution for the whole world. So also, I'm saying that you probably can increase a lot of the, uh, of the productivity of these systems in, without necessarily shifting to hybrids or shifting to commercial systems. So we, there are many ways in which you can increase the, the, the productivity of these systems and the benefits that farmers uh, derive and the humanity derive from that. So that's what I'm saying. And this is, again, in my presentation, that's why I'm saying we need to have a more balanced, nuanced discussion of that and understanding that there are multiple niches and that we shouldn't be fostering just a homogeneous idea. Clearly, as I said in my presentation, we need to produce more food, but also we have to find ways. And, and this is again, a scientific issue and a technical issue. How can we do it in a way in which we don't hamper the evolutionary processes? And these, and these processes are based on change, not on press of, 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 of static, uh, you know, and the static, and, and for example, a lot of time in my career, but in the past, I've been accused of wanting to keep small farmers poor because I'm interested in native varieties and saving seed. And I'm not interested in keeping farmers poor. On the opposite, I want farmers to benefit and to, be and to benefit from the, from the benefits that are contributing to humanity. Again, finding those types of mechanisms to do is challenging. And obviously, I cannot come up with them myself. But I think that if, if I argue in this case becomes more, maybe other people will think about it. And I think that this is part of these agroecological new perspectives and the rights of, of farmers. So, so yes, I, I think what we need to do, we need to have multiple solutions. We need to find, and, and, and again, I'm not against commercial systems or they have their place and we need them. But we, are, we also should not, as, as we should not demonize uh, the small scale farmers, we should not uh, idealize commercial uh, agriculture either. I mean, and they both have costs and benefits and trying to understand these costs and benefits is very important finding and also have distributional benefits, who benefits and who, who pays for it. And oh, back to the question of GMOs, definitely one of the big problems, the GMOs companies, the least thing they want is their, 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 their GM their, uh, traits to be out on the revolution. And you know what happens is that when that happens, you see, you see the evolution of pretty nasty weeds. Just as uh, I have been telling this story in, in the last, uh, in my presentations during the week, there's a very recent paper by some French scientists that show Teosintle is the wild relative of maize. And, uh, and it's basically in, in Mexico and Mesoamerica, but they have found Teosintle in Europe, in Spain and in France. And, and it apparently is introduction about 30 years and it has to do with this gene flow and genetic diversity mm -hmm. that has, has allowed this Teosintle to adapt to the conditions of, of France and, 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 um, and Spain. And not only that, there has been gene flow from the GM maize varieties to the Teosintle, and it's becoming a major weed in, in, in France. So, you know, there is evolution is always happening. And GMOs have consequences because it's part of evolution. Once they, this, 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 these traits enter, they start evolving and then we have surprises and we have new ideas. So, and, and, and the idea, one of the most important is we can manage evolution, but we cannot stop evolution. And, and the more we can know how to manage it effectively, the better it is. And because we control evolution in the crop doesn't mean that we are able to control evolution in a weed or in an insect or in a pest, etc. Okay. Great. 
thank you. That was a very thorough answer and I really appreciated it. Um, okay, so this question from Mahalia Clark. Uh, I've heard about some communities creating seed libraries to help with seed sharing. Is there a role for organizations slash nonprofits to facilitate things like this? Would they be able to converse and spread both local and improved varieties or are most improved varieties not shareable due to legal protections, et cetera? Yeah, well, again, yes, they are. One of the most popular interventions right now to foster uh, the maintenance of local seeds is, is the, what they call community seed banks, which, and which also involves trying to document what the seeds are and what the characteristics. And there has been a lot of work, a lot of NGOs have been involved in these uh, community seed banks. And it's, it's perceived, one of the big advantages is a very concrete uh, intervention to foster this. And so that, that, is, uh, that is good. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, you know, and, and, and I, a very important thing, I, I think that there's also a great role for citizen science if, if we are able to engage with communities and, 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 and uh, demonstrate and, and um, not demonstrate, sorry, document all this diversity and what's happening. Um, you know, improved varieties, I mean, traditionally, particularly in Mexico, it, there's a tradition of using improved varieties and in bringing them to the system and managing as native varieties and they, they change. I mean, we, we, they call the farmers call them acrioyadas or creolized varieties. I mean, but but really, this is where it comes. This whole question of the of the um, uh, of the property rights, because up to now, for example, in Mexico, this has been tolerated. This hasn't been an issue. But for example, with the adoption of, with free trade agreements, you have to adopt certain uh, property right, property pr rights uh, and and um, protection rights for for varieties. And so many of these practices theoretically should become illegal. Not necessarily that planting native varieties that always have been under this management and, are, and they are not, uh, they are heterogeneous, et cetera. Those are historical. So probably that they don't enter this, but this practice of bringing improved varieties and, and moving them and managing as local varieties, which has been part of the system and of this evolutionary system. Yeah, that, that, comes, that, that becomes a, a very important board. And see one of the dangers, and this is also associated with the introduction of GMOs because of their property rights, is that traditional practices of sharing and serving seed, which I have argued are fundamental for a crop evolution, could become at least theoretically uh, illegal practices. And, 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 and this has not to do with the biology, but it has to do with the, with the, with the property regimes and, and policy regimes associated with it. Great, thank you. Let's see what else do we have. Mm. So this question from Alejandra. My question is if you can see risk of biopiracy when industry or policies linked to industry have access to seeds of farmers and indigenous. So this that kind of, great, kind of goes off, yeah. That's a great question. And it's, a, it's very complicated, very nuanced, uh, you know, yes. Absolutely, there is a danger of bipartisan. in some people with very few scruples and also um, uh, property regimes that can be very lax. I mean, there was uh, there are already examples about the yellow beans uh, that have been trying to patent it or uh, in the New York Times, there was a very recent story of trying to patent uh, a process of producing panela, you know, a type of, of sugar that is traditional in Colombia and in Latin America. Now somebody has come up with uh, some way of uh, trying to patent it. So clearly there is an issue. On the other hand, um, you know, it, it, or the big issue of probably you've heard of, of this maize that is able to uh, capture nitrogen that is, has been documented in Mexico. And now people from the big uh, chocolate company, food company Mars and UC Davis have been studying it and they're looking at it and what's going to happen. And, 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 and again, it's, it's a very complicated issue because on the one hand, you don't want that to happen. On the, on the other hand, you know, the whole point is if you want, if we are interested in crop evolution, it's, it's to, to be able to be useful for humanity. So how do you balance that again becomes a crucial issue. Also a very important thing is that by documenting 
a lot of these local systems and these local varieties and actually putting in the global domain, in the public domain, you are preventing other people from uh, patenting or, uh, or getting uh, uh, you know, specific property rights that shouldn't exist there. So as I said, it's, it's, a, it's, it's again a very nuanced and complicated matter that I cannot answer. And I, I, I actually don't have the answer for all, but it, a very important things to, to question. And as I said, if we think that we need to maintain crop evolution and for the benefits of humanity, there should be a way in which the, 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 the options that are generated by this evolution become available to the rest of humanity. Otherwise, you know, then, then how can you um, argue for the, 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 the support of these systems for in, the, in the name of humanity and the future of food systems? So, so again, the, and, and again, this would we also talk about the governance that goes with your countries and, uh, uh, and and there are many governance issues and treaties that are trying to address that, but sometimes it's still not very clear. And also, I think we need to analyze many of these treaties from the perspective of the crop evolution, uh, from a crop evolutionary perspective and, and see really what, what they mean. Great, thank you. Um, so another question that kind of goes off what you had talked about in your last answer from Barbieri um, would you give your thoughts on the role of academia in supporting the shifts you describe? What are some of the challenges and opportunities, for example, research funding uh, for researchers to help support shifts away from prioritization of business model, private business focused interventions? And I would add to that, uh, how do we make sure that farmers are adequately compensated for the, the knowledge that we obtain from them? Yeah. Well, you know, for the, about the first thing with farmers is that you need to acknowledge the contribution. That's the first part that's very fundamental. I mean, the whole question of compensation, sometimes we see compensation as a very monetary type thing. It, that's not necessarily the, 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 the case. So this also depends very much on this, uh, on, the, on the systems uh, uh, in the specific places. But what can we do in academia? I think that academia has it's important to, to really illuminate or, or describe and analyze all these issues and bring forward, uh, you know, uh, uh, an analytical and evidence base that show that these actually are important things, that this is not an ideological thing, that this is not just, uh, you know, uh, idealized people, but in fact, there are good reasons and, and scientific reasons to do. For example, I think that a very important part of, uh, you know, the work we have done in Mexico with Conavio is to try to quantify. I mean, what does it mean that you have three or four million hectares of maize planted to native maize by more than a million farmers in many different environments? And then translate that into what is the effective population size? What is the, 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 the potential, you know, the potential for maintaining rare alleles or for appearing new mutations. So it's trying to translate these um, patterns into, into parts that are meaningful for evolution, for, for the food supply, et cetera. And that this has been a lot of my work lately. And not only also in the case of Mexico is to show that, the, for example, that many of these small scale farmers that, that are perceived to be subsistence oriented, in fact, they produce much more maize or corn than it would be necessarily for that for their own subsistence. So the, the, this idea these are just subsistence farmers, in the aggregate seems to be uh, it seems to it's, it's a little bit of a, a, a myth. I think it's it's a lot about uh, challenging many of these positions, but challenging with evidence and, and science, you know, and 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 also understanding that these are nuanced arguments and that. The political and ideological uh, parts that surround this, and that uh, you know, going back to GM, you know, saying yes, GM technology can be very useful, but we need to understand when and where and how, and we should not be just taking this wholesale thing that oh, you know, without GM, you know, the world is going to end. You know, I think that this is, and that's where science and academia can help. Mauricio, uh, yes, I'm gonna if I may abuse my panelist and uh, faculty host function for a second, you know, part of the answer for sort of benefit sharing for farmers, and this comes to some extent to Jorge's question as well, 
we have an international framework for access and benefit sharing. Mm -hmm. The Nagoya Protocol to the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, Annex One of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources in the Standard Material Transfer Agreement that it creates. My sense as, as a biopirate, or at least an <laughs> accused biopirate, someone who's a fair portion of my own work has been built around building collections of, of wild relatives or land races. Um, my sense of the entire international framework is that it has been effective as a way to try to funnel money to gene banks, but that yeah, major absolutely. corporations are work basically skip it entirely. Uh, when money does in fact flow, say to the global South, if I take a land race from Ethiopia and follow all the rules, the money goes to a well internationally educated gene bank manager who is not from one of the 84 minor ethnic groups of Ethiopia. Uh, it's almost certainly uh, Aramaic and uh, or Amara, not Aramaic, uh, <laughs> wrong area, right language group. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, or, you know, the, the same is, is true in, in Mexico to a great extent. It's not going back to an indigenous village in Uaca or Chiapas. And there's this huge gap in that anything collected before 1993 isn't covered by the CBD at all. So, um, you know, both in terms of biopiracy and in terms of access to the gene banks, uh, it seems to me like nothing in the system works uh, or that everything works to the advantage of those who already have the advantage. Yeah, no, I, I can't agree more. I think that, in fact, we need to uh, talk about the academia. We need more of these types of analysis out there. And we really look at who benefits and who loses in these systems that have the best of intentions, but not necessarily. Big. And this is not also to criticize uh, gene banks. I mean, but if you look at the, at the policies about maintaining diversity, they're dominated by the narrative that what we need is to support gene banks. And I think that gene banks have, are, are and you, we have heard so many times about Svalbard and how important it is. You, I probably have heard, this is these uh, caves in northern, in northern Norway, I think in Norway, and where they are keeping all these seeds. And, and yes, it's a good idea. And, and, and there's the whole, the Crop Diversity Trust, which is just trying to get a lot of money to do, not that they get a lot, but they get some money. And, and, and again, it's, it's valid. It's, it's not necessarily invalid, but, but to think that the whole question of maintaining this diversity and making useful, is only associated with gene banks, I think it's, it's again, it's another myth of the, it's another narrative that is a, a partial narrative that I think we should uh, uh, question. Yeah, but I agree with Eric at all. And, and there is a whole, so many, maybe somebody of you might want to do a, a more in-depth analysis of the benefits and costs for in how they're distributed among uh, the, the parties in these treaties, and which have basically benefit gene banks and breeders in international centers, I should say, which I used to be part of. <laughs> Thank you for both of your input. Um, I don't think we have time for one more question. It's gonna try and ask one more, but I don't think we have time. Um, so on behalf of the Gun Institute, I want to thank Mauricio and everyone who's joined us online. We'll have the video and podcast of today's talk available next week. Um, you please join us again next Friday for our next gun exchange with Emily Bellar Bellarmino from UVM, whose talk sustainable healthy diets and pro-environmental behaviors will be on February 19th. And I just wanna let everyone know that if you are interested in uh, continuing this conversation afterwards, um, there is a now a link in the chat where we can move to just a meeting. It won't be a webinar. So Mauricio can see everyone's face and we can have a nice conversation. Um, so please find that in the, in the chat box. Um, so thank you. Thank you to all of you, and I hope you find this uh, this and and basically I hope that this mobilizes your thinking and see how you can contribute to changing these policies. 
and, and science and evidence. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Okay. Bye.